Hey, hello and welcome. My name is Madhuri Ja, my pronouns are she, hers, and I am the director of the Kennedy Satcher Center for Mental Health Equity, an entity of Satcher Health Leadership Institute here at the Morehouse School of Medicine. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to our five-part roundtable series, Criminal Justice and Equity, Bridging the Gaps. This series has been made possible through generous sponsorship from WellPath Cares Foundation. From January through May, we are bringing you a monthly roundtable to address how we as a system, as communities, and as professionals can ensure that equitable solutions include a population that has been historically neglected and grossly ignored from policies and programs nationally, the justice involved. Today's discussion is one that I personally feel very connected to, as it is, it is one that will tackle how our behavioral health system can better respond to the mental health of the justice involved. Our speakers represent a variety of roles that interface with mental health care, social services, law enforcement, diversion programs, and systems monitoring. While they are all leaders and experts, they are also people with a close personal connection to their reason for remaining in this work. Due to the volume of registrants we have logged into this Zoom, we will be turning off the public chat and Q&A functions during our event. However, you can privately contact our team using the chat and we will feature audience questions that we see come up with frequency. We are recording this, so there will be a viewing available to people later on, and uh, we will be able to share that with you once it is produced after the Zoom is finished. Without further ado, we begin our welcome remarks. It is my honor to reintroduce all of you, and for those of you who are new today, to my close colleague and our co-founder of the Kennedy Satcher Center, former Congressman and author of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, Patrick J. Kennedy. He will be followed by recorded remarks from Dr. Arthur Evans, CEO of the American Psychological Association. There will be a short break after remarks so we can get our panelists all set up with their tech, and then we will begin the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madhuri. I appreciate this opportunity once again to join you. You're doing a fantastic job taking your incredible experience uh, in working in this field for so long and so honored to have you as part of the uh, Kennedy Satcher team here at <clears throat> Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar of for why uh, um, I have uh, started this initiative with Dr. Satcher, as you all know, Dr. Satcher was the uh, first Surgeon General to issue a Surgeon General support on mental health. And uh, I got to work with him back while he was doing that as I was in the midst of fighting to get the bill passed called the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. And Dr. Satcher was enormously helpful in that effort to pass uh, the MAPIA law. And, um, and we've remained uh, friends since, and I am so honored to um, have this webinar uh, going now as, as a further effort in collaborating on how do we address some of these um, societal uh, inequities, uh, both towards people with mental illness and towards people of color. And as we know, um, the default, unfortunately, in our country for a lack of a mental health and addiction care system is we, we, we criminalize uh, mental illness and addiction. And uh, as we also know, through the closer awareness that we've had post George Floyd about the systemic racism that continues to persist in our country, we know that uh, our criminal justice system incarcerates too many people of color. So there is a convergence here because as we know, so much of mental illness and addiction is triggered by a trauma. And of course, uh, there's, there are hardly any communities in our country uh, who are more impacted by the societal trauma of systemic racism, microaggression, and the impact of uh, uh, disproportionate access to uh, care, um, the impact of of so many uh, other societal uh, systems that uh, really pit people of color against a, a very um, upside down system. And, and as a result, we have too many people who are 
suffering from these illnesses who, who have no treatment and no access to care and, and for whom the criminal justice system becomes the default. So the point of these webinars is trying to not only put a spotlight on that, but, but to most importantly, put a spotlight on what kind of policies we need to adopt in order to change the status quo. So if we have an opportunity someday to pass the George Floyd Act, um, my hope is that we can get kind of a ACO model for our justice involved population, much like we have accountable care organizations to reduce uh, you know, re-entry, if you will, into our emergency rooms and hospitals. We, we, our medical system pays to keep people out of emergency rooms. It, it puts value on those provider networks that do a better job at keep, keeping people uh, out of being re-hospitalized. Why don't we take that same model and incentivize justice-involved uh, services to keep people out of jail and prisons, as opposed to the current financial incentives, which are really just to fill uh, prison beds. And uh, we have a general idea that more supportive housing, more vocational education, um, more trauma-informed care, addiction care, and mental health care, all together, uh, and, and access to vocational training, all together can dramatically, dramatically reduce recidivism. But what we need to do is, is sketch out what are the policies that will accomplish those changes. And I believe, again, if we model after the Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers, um, which are prospective payment models that do wraparound services, and we embed that uh, somehow through various payment systems, including using the existing justice involved uh, money that is so significant in this country towards a new aim, we can uh, really change not only the lives of people who are currently incarcerated and prospective uh, incarcerated populations, but we can change their family's life because we know how much uh, families, children are impacted uh, by their parents being incarcerated. There is such a systemic impact we can make on our society and on, on so many people's lives if we really advance this, this cause. So I thank everybody for participating today and all of your great work and all that you can do to help us this is not just one-off webinar. We want you invested in this as you already are in this effort to translate your experience and knowledge into better public policy, which has been the legacy of David Satcher in his work and, and the legacy, frankly, of my family um, and their efforts to try to address uh, uh, inequities in our society. So thank you again for being part of this. And, I know we're gonna hear from my good friend, Arthur Evans now. Thank you so much, Patrick. So our, uh, Dr. Evans expresses apologies. He could not be here in person today, but did send a recorded remark that he wanted to convey to all of you. So we're very lucky to be able to share that with you now. Hi, I'm Dr. Arthur Evans. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the American Psychological Association. And I appreciate this opportunity to make a few comments before the panel. When we deal with complex issues like people with behavioral health conditions who are incarcerated, I think it's important for us to challenge false narratives and erroneous notions. Let me give you an example. When I was commissioner for behavioral health in the city of Philadelphia, I used to consistently hear this idea that the people who were incarcerated were the people who um, the behavioral health system had failed. When we actually looked at who the people were who were incarcerated, who had, for example, mental illness, we did this work with our colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania. What we found was that most of the people who were incarcerated had never been connected to the behavioral health care system. 
that if you were connected to the behavioral health care system, you were much less likely to be incarcerated. So a more appropriate narrative would have been the people who are incarcerated are more likely to be people who have never had an opportunity to be connected to the behavioral health system. And when we look at problems through that lens, it opens up new possibilities for solutions. Is it that we don't have enough capacity? Or is it that perhaps there is stigma in communities that prevent people from reaching out for help? Or is it that we don't have enough mental health literacy in our social systems and in our communities to identify people earlier so that they can get help before they end up in the criminal justice system? Is it that we are not using innovative strategies like the sequential intercept model where we embed mental health or substance use professionals throughout the, the criminal justice system to identify people at the earliest possible moment? The fact is that these are complex problems and they're not simple solutions. And if we're going to make any progress, we have to be open to new and fresh ideas and looking at problems differently. I hope that as you listen to this panel that you're able to expand how you think about these problems, hear some new ideas, and ultimately for us to take these ideas to our communities and policymakers so that we can make a difference on this issue. Thank you and enjoy the panel. All righty. Well, I am feeling very charged up to have this discussion with all of us, um, especially after Patrick kicks us off, always with the amount of passion that he comes to the table with, and Dr. Evans with his long history working in community psychology and now leading up the charge for the APA. So we are going to tackle a, a conversation that I, again, said is very close to me personally as a licensed clinical social worker and discussing how the current state of behavioral health services administration can help or harm outcomes for the justice involved. In today's discussion, we will highlight best practices that our esteemed panelists have seen in efforts to make our systemic response more equitable. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our five panelists for this session. We have Dr. Jessica Claver, who is Senior Director of Behavioral Health Services at the Center for Alternative Sentencing and Employment Services in New York City. Nicole Palumbo, Program Specialist and Special Consultant for the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Dr. Pierluigi Mancini, President of the Multicultural Development Institute, Psychologist and Leading Consultant in Culturally Responsive Care. China Quarker, Referral Manager for the Atlanta Policing Alternatives and Diversion Initiative. And last but not least, Cassandra Kirk, Chief Magistrate Judge, Magistrate Court of Fulton County, who oversees our mental health courts here, here in Atlanta. Welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for joining us today for this important discussion in our five-part series. To our attendees, there is a Q&A section here that you can send a question to if you hear that. Um, we will try and field those as much as possible. We also ask all of you to send some questions ahead of time in your registration. So to our panelists, we will include those at the end, um, if we have time to be able to cover those for our group. Um, I say to you that this is a discussion that we're all gonna find is very engaging. If you hear something from one of your colleagues that you would like to follow up with, you can either raise your hand like this, I'll see it, or you can use your raise hand function and I'll tag you in. Um, and you know, I encourage you to channel your own identity and how it influences your sustained success in your work. Um, and I ask you to think about your role, the specific work you do for the justice involved and how you feel it translates to equity as we go through a discussion today on how we can make our behavioral health system more equitable. So Dr. Claver, I'm gonna actually start with you first for our first question. Um, and that is, you know, in your opinion, uh, what can we do to improve the system, the way our system addresses behavioral health needs of justice involved? You have worked in forensic psychology for a very long time. You had a, the behavioral health services department of a large alternative to incarceration organization in New York. Um, tell us about what you think unique needs are, you know, that we are addressing well and that we could do a better job of to kick us off. Thank you, Madhuri, and thank you for having me here today on this panel. Um, and uh, so I appreciate the question about how we can address behavioral health needs specifically for this population. Um, cases where I oversee programs in New York City, um, the mission of our organization is specifically this population. 
And so we have a lot of experience in sort of tailoring behavioral health needs to, uh, or behavioral health services to the specific needs of people who've been impacted by the criminal legal system. Um, for example, people coming out of state prison or people um, who have been incarcerated in city jails or people who are on probation and parole. So um, a few ideas. Um, one thing is that um, this is a population that all, often has multiple needs at the same time. And so it's not just a mental health diagnosis usually. It's, it's also oftentimes a substance use disorder struggle, maybe homelessness. So multiple, multiple factors together. And so one of our goals has always been to uh, try our best to provide kind of a one, one stop <laughs> shopping for them in terms of um, how we can provide services to them. Um, our clients, you know, they, they come out of um, incarceration settings often with multiple priorities and demands and appointments and, and it's hard for them. Um, and it's much, much easier for them to engage in any service um, if all the services are together for them. So um, uh, Patrick mentioned the uh, Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers. Um, we have a CCBHC at Cases in New York City. Um, we actually have um, one, of, one of the few identified kind of forensic CCBHCs in the country. So we, um, we kind of have our own unique twist on it um, in terms of helping people navigate their legal situations as part of the CCBHC. So we can provide wraparound services, not only the psychiatric services, um, but we also have primary care on site. You know, we know that people who've been in incarceration settings, like maybe they haven't had a physical in 10 years. Uh, they're more likely to get it if it's right down the hall from their psychiatrist. Um, we also provide substance use services integrated with our physical health and behavioral health services. So the experience for the client is really kind of seamless um, and they're able to get all their needs met in, in one place and also really in kind of a trauma informed way. I think that that's, that's one thing in terms of our staff training that's important I think for this population is to really understand um, not only the traditional traumas we think of uh, when we go through checklists <laughs> with people, but the trauma of being incarcerated, the trauma of racism, the trauma of interactions they've had with the police. So really, really um, making sure our staff understand that so we can have, have a welcoming environment for this um, group of individuals. Absolutely. So much there that you highlighted that's really important. In a little bit, we're going to talk about some specific interventions, too, that can work really well to address behavioral health conditions. Um, but Dr. Mancini, Dr. Claver mentioned what being trauma-informed means. And, you know, next month for folks who are staying tuned for this roundtable, we're actually going to tackle what a trauma-informed system looks like for the justice involved. But now she mentioned trauma and racism, systemic trauma. You've done a lot of work in working with the Latinx and immigrant communities um, nationally and internationally. And you know, tell me in your opinion, what are some unique needs you know, in thinking about systemic issues of the justice involved that come to mind for you in working with this population? Thank you so much. And hello, everybody. It really is a pleasure to be here with you today. And good to see you again, Mr. Kennedy. Um, you know, the, the, the work that I've been focusing on really is with, with immigrants and refugees, and it has to focus on the cultural, cultural responsiveness and the linguistic access. So when we're talking about trauma, just the expression of trauma is different in individuals that were not born here, that were not raised here. So we need to make sure that, that we present the information in a way that can be understood, but more importantly, we need to make sure that we understand what individuals are trying to tell us. So what we can define as a trauma here in the United States in, in westernized medicine um, language may be totally different to how other people understand it. They may not even be aware that, that with the, where they had been living and the conditions that were being brought up in can be considered part of trauma. So we have, um, kind of ingrain um, 
racism and discrimination in, in the system that causes a problem because so many people are in denial about that. So just having people to come up and understand that we need to acknowledge that some of these problems exist, that there are differences, not only as to how people end up in the criminal justice system, but what happens once they get there. Now, it, it's also, and actually there was a recent experience, right? So it, it, um, um, a Latina immigrant uh, was having a crisis and she called 911 here in, in Georgia. They, they sent not only the police, but they actually sent a, a crisis response team, a clinician to be able to be there. Um, but because of language and cultural differences, she ended up going into the hospital for 72 hour observation. And she came out of there so traumatized uh, from being in a psychiatric hospital for 72 hours, not understanding what had happened. She had no idea what happened during the interview, what she said or did or how she acted that would have caused this um, uh, involuntary hospitalization. So there is some work that needs to happen uh, when it comes to helping us understand how people express themselves, how they express this, their symptoms, how they express their problems and the origin of their problems that don't necessarily translate into having either a, a, a criminal um, action or an involuntary hospitalization happen. Yeah, it makes me think a lot of a lot of the clients I've worked with too. Their their first diagnosis comes when they're incarcerated, you know. So especially in the immigrant undocumented community, refugee community, where there's already so much stigma about behavioral health concerns, sometimes it's your first access point when you're in crisis and unfortunately might end up incarcerated as opposed to getting access to the care you need. Correct. Judge Kirk, you are leading the charge here in terms of mental health court and as well overseeing diversion, you know, opportunities that we have in Atlanta. Um, tell us what's coming to mind for you when you think about unique needs. Oh, I think you're We're muted. Signing. Welcome to Zoom. I said <laughs> thank you all for inviting me to join you all today. I'm invigorated by the energy and just really look forward to a meaningful conversation. As we start, I would and we are specifically talking about incarcerated individuals. And so I am unsure if anyone on this panel has had some of the experiences that I have had. And so I will share. I started my legal career, um, well, when I moved into my criminal justice side of my legal career, I started as a prosecutor, which meant our job was send everybody to jail, send everybody to jail. I switched at some point and I became a um, defense attorney, which meant I now had to go into the jail. And so I had to hear the door climb playing behind me as I went to go interview children in the jail. That experience opened my eyes to what it is they were experiencing. As a prosecutor, it was not my job to care how they felt. It was not my job to figure out what that looked like. Our job was justice and just for justice for us was tempered by the number of people that we sent down in that path. Having also served as a defense attorney, I have also served as a child advocate attorney which has given me the misfortune of having to visit my clients in locked residential facilities, some of whom I have watched eat like animals. And I have to think, has their caseworker not come to visit them in this institution? I have seen children guarding their food while I'm attempting to have a conversation with them. I have seen my clients be so incredibly drugged that they walk down the hall and bump into the wall. Um, and so when we, have not seen where our clients are, where, our, where these people that we represent are. I think it allows us to distance ourselves from this conversation and it allows it to be very, very clinical. For me, this is not clinical. I used to be a child advocate attorney and I used to be hell on wheels. I can tell you, um, one of my judges used to be like, Judge Kirk, please stop making them cry. And I said, here's the problem. I can't stop making them cry because these are children. These are children that their parents either lost custody of, but they trust that you will care for them. And you can't care for them if you're not watching them. You're not looking at them and you're not paying attention to them. And so what I find is a lot of this system is really people dehumanizing the people that we really want. And I don't wanna say love on it because that's not the point, but we really wanna care for and we're unable to care for them. And so when this first question, when I looked at the question, my first question was, 
Have you been to the jail? Have you smelled that smell? So like mm -hmm. the first thing is clean the jail, right? Clean the place where we tell people we're gonna send you. Clean those institutions where we send people. Um, and I have been in a, like I said, I've got, I've represented kids who have been detained. I have um, attempted to get one of my friends who was raped into a place where she felt safe. And that was just hell, like just trying to find out she was a sex survivor. She had been, um, like it was hell just trying to get the right person to get her where she needed to be. And I am a person that has access. I'm a person that has an ability to speak. And so I can't imagine what it would be like for other people in the community. And so for me, speaking to a police officer or speaking to somebody in a higher level is easy for me because I am comfortable there, but everyone's not gonna have an advocate like me. And so that leaves a whole lot of people without space. And then when you contact who it is that should be advocating for them, and if I'm going off, off topic, just tell me to slow down. But it, it's, I think the people at the top don't realize what the entry level looks like for those people you're attempting to push through. And so I can have high level conversations all day long, but if we don't all start with where people start that intake, where that first contact happens, right? Um, what does the institution look like for children? What does the jail look like coming in? Even as a judge, I come in to our jail through the back door, which means on both sides of me are cages of people. I am walking down with an armed guard, walking through cages of other humans as I go to my courtroom, and then they will bring those humans from the cells that they are holding them in into the courtroom and expect that they will sit and be kind. I have been cursed out a couple of times through my from my behavioral health clients, and I get it. I can't get angry because at the end of the day, um, right, you've been locked up, you've been sent here, you've got needs. Like people are like, I just want snacks. I can't address that. I like, like, where do I send that? Um, so I think for me, that's the the system is not set up to be gentle or kind. It's set up to be punitive for those people that haven't been punished yet. And so yeah. I think that recognition is where I start, like clean the jail, wash the cells, um, give people like proper clothing. Yeah. Absolutely. And the passion you're coming with, I'm looking at your colleagues just kind of resonate with everything that you're saying, you know, and all of you have worked in various types of setting interfacing with a lot of the the same types of challenges that Judge Kirk is mentioning to us. China and Nicole, I wanna pull you into this. China, you are the referral manager for uh, an amazing initiative that we have down here in Atlanta to create diversion spaces for people and you know, avoid a pathway to incarceration. Um, and you've also worked in incarceration facilities. You know, so tell me about what you think some of the historical reasons are some of your clients have not had a pathway to thriving, you know, when you think of inequity and hearing your colleagues, what's inspiring you to think of solutions to that problem? Yeah, thank you so much um, for, for creating this space. And I think just this is a timely conversation during Black History Month where we know Black and Brown people have been disproportionately affected by criminalizing mental illness, criminalizing poverty, um, and, and really just having the short end of a, the stick when it comes to addressing some of the social justice needs that we have here. Um, in, in my work uh, inside of Georgia's prisons, um, I was a behavioral health counselor. So that meant that I I had a caseload of 400 people and I went and saw them weekly. And um, at that level, just thinking about uh, what Ms. Kirk just, just mentioned, you know, you really get a different perspective of what the needs are. You get a different perspective of what it's like to be black and brown in these spaces or what it's like to just be a human in these spaces and not having your needs met. Um, as I said previously, I think historically, you know, we've as Black people have been disenfranchised, have not had access to mental health care, have not had uh, good experiences when it came to uh, law enforcement or what it felt like to call for assistance when your loved one is experiencing something that you yourself have never seen before. Um, and it brings up a lot of things for me. Uh, the first is what um, I think worries me when it comes to this kind of situation, because I think, 
to the, the point earlier, you know, when we are thinking about uh, how to address mental health concerns, we have to think of the whole thing. And with justice involved individuals, a lot of them are on probation or parole with mental health concerns, expected to meet with their probation officer, expected to, um, you know, have all of these deadlines and also provide for themselves, provide for their families. And they're not being assisted with that. We can't just address the mental health concerns. We have to also make sure that people have places to live, safe places to exist. Um, and also just access to all levels of care, whether it be mental health or physical health. Um, so just historically, I just want to point out that we are um, just speaking particularly for BIPOC communities, we don't have that trust in the system to where we will call an, uh, an entity like PAD to assist our family members when we know when we've called before they've ended up incarcerated. So in order to really uh, assist folks in, in really addressing these needs, I think we need to first recognize how it's been addressed previously. Um, Earlier, it was mentioned that people um, are forced into involuntary hospitalization. And I think that just speaks to the historical need to disappear people. Um, instead of going and addressing these concerns, instead of getting people connected to the resources that they need, they are forced into hospitalization. And after 72 hours, they can sign themselves out and the cycle continues. So I think we just need to address it more uh, holistically and not just as a mental health concern. Absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the things that we'll touch on is certain policies, um, you know, that we have across the country that mandate behavioral health services and what that looks like. Um, Nicole, in your role, you oversee a lot of mobile behavioral health services in New York City at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, I have a bias, having been a team leader for an assertive community treatment team previously, uh, is that, you know, mobile treatment for folks, especially being released from prison with a mental health diagnosis, is a really effective way to literally meet someone where they are and what that looks like. But, you know, tell us from your perspective, too, you know, what, what that looks like in a catchment paradigm. You know, speaking to Judge Kirk's point, a lot of the clients who end up with behavioral health diagnoses and are incarcerated have had, you know, we know about adverse childhood experiences, giving someone a propensity to have impulsivity, risk attached to their behaviors and, you know, kind of be on a pipeline to incarceration if they don't get access to the support they need. Um, so I want to pull you into this in your role. You know, what are you seeing as beneficial for folks? You know, is something like an act referral too late? Is it a great step? You know, is there more that we can be doing for someone so that they don't end up in a cycle of being incarcerated or hospitalized? Thanks, Madre. And I've been like listening to everyone and as a clinical social worker who is working in communities and doing that work, it stri strikes such a chord of um, from that perspective and then thinking from a systems perspective, um, working for a government entity that works with a lot of these programs who um, does a lot of technical assistance with our intensive mobile behavioral treatment teams like an ACT um, or a forensic ACT or in New York City we have the intensive mobile treatment teams which are a newer uh, more intensive even um, catchment of those who fall through the cracks of, of an ACT program or, or, or a clinic program and and I'm just thinking as we we're talking about the holistic approach and that when these programs um, can meet people where they're at, right? Where if someone's coming out of jail or prison or even just the court system in general and they're attached to one of these um, intensive ACT programs or IMT programs, they give that holistic approach, right? Like you have psych and you have RN and you have medical and you have all different social workers or mental health professionals who are trying to attack um, homelessness or trying to attack um, medical care or all these other psychosocial factors that come into play. And I think more is needed that addresses that encompasses this whole care. But I, speaking to your point, Madhuri, about is it too little too late? Um, you know, I think that it brings us back to the discussion of our systems working together for the same goal. And are we addressing the systemic racism that built these systems in the first place? Because if we're building programs to try to help um, people of color with 
justice involved care, people who are homeless or um, have a mental health diagnosis or all of the above, we have to pull apart our systems as well. It's an individual work and it's building these programs that maybe stop fitting a, a round peg in a square hole. Um, we know that there are fidelity models that work, like an ACT model that works, but we also know that there are people who fall through the cracks of those models. And um, thinking about it from an equity lens, how are we engaging our communities where there are real pockets or lack, lack, lack of resources um, from early childhood mental health all the way up to, you know, the people who are being connected to care after they've been in prison for 30 years. You know, how are we looking at this, um, not just from a systems approach and developing, you know, more programs or government developing more programs, but are we talking to the communities that it serves? Are we really building programs that are gonna serve those um, in disenfranchised co uh, communities, those who have been um, overlooked? Are we integrating trauma-informed care that has been really, um, working with the BIPOC population or immigrant population? Are we using those um, mental health perspectives when we're building these programs? And so I know we are working hard internally to really address our own structural racism. We're, uh, we're all agencies that have been built. All these systems such as homeless shelters, um, prison systems, we can historically go back and look at what those were built on. Um, and so we have to do the work individually, we have to do the work programmatically, but we also have to take it as a larger system and how are we pulling apart um, the racist practices and are we using a racial equity lens as we continue to build these kinds of programs. And what does that look like, right? And, and who does our system serve and how do we, you know, increase the visibility of marginalized groups, you know, one of our panelists next month when we talk about trauma-informed systems is a Pawnee attorney, you know, who works really hard in trying to understand prosecution law on tribal reservations, for example, um, and how difficult it is to actually gain visibility when tribal policing supersedes uh, state policing and what that looks like for someone. Um, and as well, you know, what their incidents and incarceration can end up being when they really just need access to behavioral health care. So there's so many lenses here about um, what that looks like, you know, I think uh, Judge Kirk, I, you know, and, and Dr. Claver, when you talk about visibility, right, the word visibility for you, when we're talking about a population that's very invisible, what comes to mind for you in your two roles? Because your two roles are leadership positions in different ways, right? You know, Dr. Claver, you're overseeing a really large behavioral health services portfolio. And, and Judge Kirk, you're overseeing our court system here in, in Fulton County and trying to think through how your own experiences maybe create a bias for you to say, I want to see things work well and their system may not see it that way. So when you think about visibility, what, what does that mean to you? Judge Kirk, I'll go to you first. And so I'm unsure that it's visibility or a willingness. So what I mean by that is the people clearly aren't invisible because we see them to arrest them. We see them to pick them up. We see them for all of the negative that we wish to place upon them. So we see them. We just don't see them as, I should say, some in the system don't see them as deserving more than what they are scheduled to get. So we clearly see them. It's just how we choose to respond to them. And then once we intake someone into the system, I'll start with an adult accused of a crime. First off, we're going to call that person a defendant. We're going to give that person a number. They're going to stand on a wall like their name goes away. Um, we're going to fingerprint them to make sure we know who they are. We're going to give them that number. And then we're going to give them another number as we schedule them through the system that is meant to get them to first appearance and then eventually maybe release, but then eventually to trial. And so they are visible when we need them to be, and they are invisible when we must process them. And the quicker we get to not think of them as being human beings, it makes it very easy for us to stick them in those cages, to stick them in those places where they have to look at us behind the walls. And then it's, as a judge, when I walk through, if there are, when I walk through the jail, 
the people accused of crimes that are in there who have not been convicted are made to turn and not look at me as I walk through. Um, like I, I'm unsure if that's my safety or their safety because once they come into the courtroom, I'm gonna see them and they're gonna see me face to face. And I think it's just another level of control, um, but it's also dehumanizing. And so when the guards walk me through the jail, they're almost like, please just keep walking, just keep walking. Because if I see an, a person who's accused of a crime that I know that's in my misdemeanor mental health court program, I'm gonna turn around and be like, hey, where have you been? You're like, Judge Kirk, please keep walking. But at the end of the day, right, if I saw this person in the street, I would do the same thing. It, it's, it creates an artificial system and many people are comfortable in that artificial system because it makes us safe. But I also realize that me stopping to speak with someone makes the guard concerned, makes the detention officer concerned for my safety, for her safety. Um, you know, and so I get the safety piece, but I think if we restored the humanity to the individuals, they take care of that. Right. Right. And what does eye contact mean? Right. And so many different ways. If we're talking about visibility. What does eye contact mean? Uh, Dr. Claver, your experiences are diverse in terms of how you've worked with people who are forensic affiliated. You know, tell us, you know, for, for the audience as a forensic psychologist, what does visibility mean to you? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thanks Judge Kirk for your uh, comment. I totally agree um, how the system makes people visible or invisible, you know, based on their, their own interests. Um, and so when I think about visibility um, for our population that we serve, um, so many things come to mind, but um, at a program level, you know, I'm in charge of um, running a lot of programs, um, serving these populations. And I think of one way that we create visibility is um, through the kind of staff that we hire um, to serve people in these programs. So um, one thing that CASES is very, very committed to is I don't think we have any programs uh, at CASES that don't employ what we call peer specialists. Um, so these are people with lived experience. It might be um, experience in, with their own mental health struggles, with their own substance use struggles. Um, at CASES, it's often people who have their own experience um, in the criminal legal system. Um, and so I think that this is one way to create visibility um, in, in a new way that actually um, kind of allows someone who has been in the shoes of the people that we serve to then be on the other side um, to provide hope um, to those who are kind of still stuck in a system um, and trying, trying to become visible in, 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 uh, in their own meaningful way. Um, and this really helps with engagement. Um, it really, really helps people, I think, in their process, um, if they're, for example, considering, you know, engaging in behavioral health services to talk to someone who, who has the same lived experience. And, and not only kind of hiring uh, what we call peer specialists at cases, but also hiring people with lived experience at every level. So not just people who are on the ground engaging our clients, which is very important, but um, at supervisor levels, at director levels, at levels that really can have influence on uh, policy and procedure and the way the, way the whole organization um, provides care. That's so important. You know, I think you're also demonstrating and modeling to what a true chance at thriving looks like, right? When your entire organization is representative of creating those pathways for people. And I think our system, unfortunately, loses sight of that. Um, what does that mean for someone to progress professionally and be able to hold space? And, and some of our, our panelists last month spoke about that as well, that many of their own directors you know, at the Vera Institute for Justice or Latino Justice Pure LDEF are people with lived experience and are formerly incarcerated and will continue to have folks in leadership, you know, that represent that here. Dr. Mancini, it makes me think too about language access, you know, when we talk about peer specialists and, you know, when you think about a crisis call, um, many of us here who are clinicians have had to make a, a really horrific 911 call and it's a law enforcement response for someone who actually needs care and I'm thinking about people who don't you know speak English as their primary language for you what does visibility mean what would work you know in those moments 
So th this is very scary because I don't know if you can see my screen, but you're pretty much reading off my script. In <laughs> Very, very scary. So I, I was thinking exactly what you said when the judge and Dr. Claver were speaking about visibility, because everything that they're describing, it, it means something completely different for someone that doesn't speak the language uh, proficiently, right? And, and we have to be really careful about how does someone end up in the criminal justice system to start with? So we do have the stories about misunderstanding uh, misdiagnosing because of culture and language barriers. Well, we have the same thing in criminal justice. People end up being arrested because of language and cultural differences. And once they get in the system, um, it becomes then a criminal issue. So whatever they may have had in behavioral health problems before they were arrested, now it just becomes more of that criminal issue um, and there are no resources in those languages. And you know, like, like the Congressman has said before, is we need to normalize the conversation, first of all. And I think that that's something that needs to be carried at every level. Besides the, um, because there's not a lot of culture and language that's being taught at law enforcement level. So when someone goes out there and they have to respond to a situation where someone doesn't speak English very well, and, and that, proficiency level needs to be also um, uh, explained. Some people feel that if I can say hello to you in English, then I'm going to be able to explain to you my emotional needs in English. Well, that's not so. People have different levels of proficiency, and it takes three to seven years to master a new language. So every immigrant I have ever met wants to learn English or is, is actively wanting or learning English, but it takes time. And if you're a poor immigrant or, or you know, refugees that are coming in and, and they have nothing, they have a backpack, um, you have to work. And many of them work two, three jobs. So it makes it harder to learn the language. So invisibility means that you end up entering a system that you're not familiar with. You don't know how it works. You don't know how to communicate. And that just compounds on the problem. And by normalizing this, you know, we really need to continue to work towards um, providing a, a medical behavioral health solution to behavioral health problems, not a criminal justice solution to a behavioral health problem, because that it doesn't work. We need to eliminate that stigma. Even when people come out um, of, of prison or jail, not only do you have that label already that you've been in prison or jail, but if you have a, a behavioral health problem on top of that, it's gonna even compound uh, more of that problem. But the other thing I was thinking that you mentioned is workforce. And we need to look at workforce in the entire spectrum, you know, from, from psychiatrists, psychologists, um, LCSWs, like LPCs, down to peers and even volunteers. First of all, we don't have the workforce today in English to take care of all the needs that we have. Uh, I've been in this field 30 years and, and a friend of mine, a public figure called me three weeks ago they needed to see somebody. It took me almost three weeks to find someone who had space because people are not taking new clients. Now, when people come out of prison or jail and, and we're trying to connect them, we have a difficulty with that. If they don't speak the language or they're not familiar or they have different cultural explanations, we have an even bigger problem with that. So we have to continue to focus on, on making sure that everything, you know, mental health courts, all of these courts that have been set up, very, very few of them can address anyone that speaks a language other than English. So we have to look at that. And we have almost 50 million foreign born individuals in this country, and half of them are suffering in silence because of language and culture. So you, you brought up also the point of mental health courts. And I think we couldn't have a discussion as a group if we didn't talk about what policies exist to mandate behavioral health treatment. Um, so for our audience, 47 states in the United States have some kind of policy that mandates psychiatric treatment legally, um, but they vary widely in implementation and administration. There are the three states who do not have any such laws are California, Massachusetts and Maryland, although California recently instituted assisted outpatient treatment, which is one I want to focus on um, as a group here. 
Um, many of these laws have been named after community members that have been killed by someone having a psychiatric crisis. So you do have Laura's law in California, you have Kendra's law in New York, I believe over 35 of them are named after somebody, which creates a picture, in my opinion, you know, of, of what we're doing to mandate treatment and who it's for. Um, but I, I think it's important to talk about as a group, because all of you interface with alternatives to incarceration of in some way, you know, are, are policies like AOT beneficial? You know, where can we see room for growth in how we tackle mandating behavioral health services for folks? Um, it looks different. You know, we have multiple states represented here. So I'm curious to hear from you, you know, what policies work? You know, is there room for improvement? What does that look like? Um, and Nicole, maybe I'll start with you first because you interface with a lot of different, you know, agency monitoring in New York City. Um, and New York City is unique for our audience too, because there is a movement to close Rikers, which is the largest prison in New York City, really to reduce capacity and, and create pathways to alternatives. Um, but it's coming with, I'm sure, a lot of roadblocks, you know, in terms of what could that could effectively look like if we have other spaces for people that doesn't include a prison. So Nicole, I'll start with you, you know, your thoughts on AOT and what you've seen is beneficial and also where can we improve? Sure, I mean, and I think, you know, AOT is its own, you know, office within within our bureau. And but I work with programs such as ACT, in fact, and, and IMT, where, where people who are assigned assisted outpatient treatment are connected. And so what the AOT system does is this is illegal. Um, they're legally mandated to, to follow through with treatment. And if they don't follow through with treatment, their treatment plan, whether that's take their medication, you talks. Um, and they're not engaging in treatment, then, you know, the actual mental health team provider that's working can request um, a removal of which we've kind of all talked about and remove them to the hospital to then be evaluated um, and hopefully given their medication. And, you know, I think there have been times where we've seen, seen assisted outpatient treatment work for individuals where it's, it's given structure, it's given support. Um, on the flip side, what I'll say is that, you know, we um, as mental health professionals need to learn to engage with our, with the, the client population we're working with, and we're specifically talking about mental health. Um, AOT is not mental health treatment, right? AOT is the legal thing saying you have to go to mental health treatment and now follow the, the recommendations of your treatment provider. And so does it help the treatment provider if there's concerns about safety to self or safety to others in the community to have this? Sure. However, I really think that the work begins is how are we engaging with those who are attached to the mental health treatment team. And I'm sure Dr. Cleaver and everyone else can speak to that as well of how, you know, for some AOT disconnects them from mental health treatment because they're feeling now like, oh, I have this like legal mandate. I, I don't want to do treatment. I can't wait till this AOT order is over. Um, and then they're not engaging in a meaningful way with mental health treatment. And when the AOT order expires or it's no longer, you know, something that's engaged, then this person disconnects immediately from their treatment team, right? And so how are we supporting our clinicians? I mean, I'm a clinician by nature and I, even though I work in systems now, it's thinking about how are we supporting the programs that we're, we're developing? How are we helping them engage with people and outside of that AOT model? And then how are we assessing AOT in general, where it stems from? It brings me back to systemic policies that are you know, based in, in racist practices. And how are we adjusting that model so that it's actually helpful um, for the people that maybe it hasn't been helpful for, right? Like we have to look largely, but we also have to look at the population it's not helping, you know, if there may be, there's part of the population is, but how are we assessing and adjusting um, policies or um, treat your mandated treatment programs to really address those for where it's not working? Yeah, and I, I, I highlight too that it's 47 states have some kind of psychiatric mandate. However, you know, the interpretation of that also includes things like access to health insurance. You know, when someone is released from prison, for example, with a behavioral health diagnosis, if it's 
not part of the discharge plan for that person to be connected to insurance, it becomes a challenge to also then enforce the mandate, right? If even the provider can't bill for the service, for example, that they're, you know, they're providing to that person. And I think about rural parts of the country where services are way more sparse and limited access to something like, you know, so in New York City, it's ACT is often the referral source. When someone's on AOT, they'll be referred to an ACT team, which is the most intense community-based psychiatric treatment you can receive outside of a hospital. In other states, it's different. It doesn't necessarily look like that for what a legal mandate is. And so thinking about those nuances is really important. Um, but China, I want to pull you into this too. You know, you work here in, in Atlanta uh, on a program that works closely with law enforcement and creating diversions to incarceration. Um, I'm sure you also interface with things like legal mandates. Tell us, you know, what you think works and what doesn't. Yeah, I think, um, you know, at the Policing Alternatives and Diversion Initiative, our goal is to do everything by consent. You know, we make sure that people say, yes, they want you know, assistance with housing. Yes, they want assistance with treatment. And I think that goes a long way um, in thinking about mandate and people not having um, a real say in what their treatment or care looks like. It just brings in how people affected by the criminal legal system have felt throughout their time that they're incarcerated. They get told when they have to eat, they get told when they sleep, they get told where they go. And I think getting out of prison or jail and then being told, you know, what type of treatment you have to go to, what type of medication you have to take, um, often medication that makes them feel less than themselves. I don't know how we can have this societal expectation that mandating treatment or um, things like, you know, the Mental Health Parity Act that's currently in conversation in Georgia would be successful. Um, I think having people have that autonomy and having a choice in uh, the type of services that they receive while also of course getting assistance and, and observation from mental health clinicians and behavioral health clinicians I think is a good start but when we remove that choice and continue to treat folks as other it just will they'll remain in the cycle it's a really tough balance absolutely Patrick I see you want to jump in yeah no um as a point of personal reference, my brother and sister and I had my mother committed. We got full guardianship and conservatorship because she was going to kill herself. Her illness was going to kill her because she lacked insight into the impact of her illness. She was repeatedly doing life-threatening behaviors. So I believe that the justice system can be a public health system. I have been in recovery rooms for dozens of years. Personally, I'm going to be celebrating 11 years of continuous sobriety in, in next week. So I also know that um, recovery is possible. But my point is, is that the number of people I've met in the rooms who would not be there if it weren't for the justice system mandating they go to meetings. And until they can get enough awareness and insight to their illness and how they haven't had agency in other words, to your point, China, they haven't had the ability to make decisions because their illness is making decisions for them. I think we need to, and I've heard it, you know, Jessica and, and others have mentioned, we want to measure the data <clears throat> because if we want to address and uh, understand structural racism and structural impact of trauma, we need to use this modern day understanding of how to measure data so that we can support, for example, Jessica's kind of forensic CCBHC, because as much as we would all like the world to look upon people to Dr. Kirk, uh, uh, you know, Judge Kirk's view as human beings, okay? Um, we have to first win people over the, as, effectively to change the system as quickly as possible by hook or by crook, in my view. Like I would love to bring them around, uh, their hearts around, but we passed the Civil Rights Act and you know, racism hasn't changed, but because we passed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Fair Housing, Fair Employment, all of which are still under assault, 
But we've made progress because we made it illegal to practice discrimination. It didn't change people's attitudes. And I'm afraid, I don't want us to focus on trying to change people's attitudes before we change policies. I want us to change policies while we try to appeal to people's consciousness. And, you know, in my religion, Matthew 25, those are there for the least one of us, my brothers and sisters, is there for me. It's a moral outrage. That's how I was brought up to treat our fellow human beings because there but for the grace of God go I. But I can't hope that everyone's gonna see it that way. I know that the way you do policy is you say, here's the data, the adverse childhood experiences has this um, correlation to juvenile justice, truancy and the pipeline to prison. That's solid data. And if I can give that data to my colleagues at any level of government, and I should say, I got a solution for you. And for my friends on the other side of the aisle, it's saving money. It's putting money into, and you know what, we'll do a deal with you. We'll, we'll divert some of that money to supportive housing because we know supportive housing reduces the spend even more because there's less people being arrested for you know, violations of, of, of solicitation warrants, all this, you know, pedestrian stuff that clogs our justice system. And you know what, I think I can get the law enforcement community to be part, part of that, because they don't want to be in the business of having to get this clogged system of people who are just really indigent in and out of the jail system. But what I'm saying is, I want us to get to data, what I'd love to understand here, um, China is how do we measure, um, you know, the, the, the data so that we can make those right decisions on what works best for people. So it's not some obtuse mandate, like you said, that has no bearing on what that individual's needs are. Then it's less about constructing a paternalistic system that somehow contradicts people's individual freedoms as much as it is a system that is sensitive to individuals' needs and gives them the right pathway to success because I wanna be able to go to my colleagues and say, listen, this produces results, lower cost for Medicaid, lower cost of recidivism, lower, you know what I'm saying? So um, that would be my only, I was very intrigued by your, um, your point as I has, have been by everyone else's. Sorry for <laughs> crashing. Not at all. No, I mean, and also for your disclosure, Patrick, I think part of what you're also demonstrating too is you've had esteemed leadership roles for years and you also have lived experience. And, and that's part of also what, you know, Dr. Claver is talking about is we have to be able to see this at all levels and also understand privilege that comes with certain pathways that a lot of people and especially people of color don't have. Um, Judge Kirk, you had your hand up earlier. I didn't want to ignore that. You know, I, want, yeah. I, I, I did, and Mr. Kennedy mentioned it, but I would say that in criminal justice, we measure how successful criminal justice is by recidivism rates, as well as by case closure. And so as soon as the behavioral health people understand what our measures are for how effective our justice system is, I think that data would make it make sense. In Georgia, the reason we have so many accountability courts that have started is because our governor at the time, Nathan Deal, monetized it. He said, it wasn't the goodness of people in their hearts. It was, we can save money on the front end if we place accountability courts here and we don't spend all this really expensive money housing people at the jails and placing them in places that take them out of the workforce. So in Georgia, it wasn't a change of heart. It was a, hey, we can make the money make sense. And so understanding that criminal justice is measured by case closure. Sometimes that means sending people to prison. Sometimes that means adjudicating cases differently, but it is also measured by recidivism. At the end of this, how many more times am I gonna see them? What does this cycle look like? And if behavioral health can make that transition into making the trauma-informed data, all of the other data monetized to help us measure recidivism and case closure, that's the answer. 
Right, and as my uh, my colleague in leadership here, Daniel Dawes, says, if there's no data, there's no problem, right? And you know, the, if you, and that's the truth. If policymakers don't actually see the burden of an issue, it's not something that they invest in. It's not something that they feel is important. And we're talking about what diversity in data looks like. Um, China, I had noticed you'd raised your hand earlier. Yeah, I was just thinking, you know, it's hard at the clinical perspective, and maybe Nicole can give me an amen on this one, um, to see things monetarily um, from our perspective, because we're always just so worried about the person. But I will say, in terms of our data that we've collected at the Policing Alternatives and Diversion Initiative, just in our diversion services alone, is that we've seen that when we've diverted people at the level of arrest um, for uh, issues related to mental illness, substance use, or extreme poverty, that's that stop, the stop in the cycle right there. Because we're able to say, listen, that officer is able to say, listen, I've seen this person three or four times. This is someone who's back and forth to ACDC or Fulton County Jail. What can we do differently in this moment to reduce that recidivism, to reduce the um, probability that this person will be rearrested. And what we're able to say at that moment is we're not just going to take them to jail, we're going to address all of the needs. So we get them into housing if that's what they need. We get them connected to mental health services or behavioral health services if that's what they need. And then we also get them connected to community, which I think is a major point that we're missing here is that, you know, people will accept support when they have that community around them telling them that this is okay. For black and brown communities specifically, we don't have the privilege um, often to you know, have the wherewithal to say, yes, I wanna go into Grady and get my mental health care services because our brothers, our sisters, our mothers didn't have that access. They didn't know what for example, mental health, even mental health concerns look like. And so I think we have to kind of take a, a back step in thinking about recidivism um, when we are only addressing one part of the concern, because what we know is that people are more likely to uh, commit crimes when there are mental health concerns that are unmet that leads to them, you know, having survival activities um, that are often low level crimes that leave them in jail for, for weeks, so often longer than that. Yeah, and we can't, I mean, I talk about this all the time as, you know, the history we have in our diagnostic manuals as well as clinicians that are influenced by psychiatrists who were pro Jim Crow and, you know, that were against abolition of slavery and influenced a lot of where diagnoses fell and what they looked like and that the pursuit of freedom for a lot of people was seen as delusional. And that's based in history. You know, that's something that we know. Um, that carried through to when deinstitutionalization became a focus in this country to remove people from asylums and, you know, put them forth in community, that they carried those diagnoses with them. You know, I think that's an important part of this discussion too, Nicole and Dr. Claver is, you know, once someone has a diagnosis on their medical record, I think one of the things that we often see too as clinicians is that people are misdiagnosed. And you know, inclusion criteria for certain services requires a serious mental illness diagnosis, for example. So for our audience members who don't know what that includes, that would be schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, um, bipolar disorder. And you know, the severity of those symptoms is often seen often as criminal in risk, right? Because if someone decompensates what happens to them, but people are also misdiagnosed. Um, and what does that look like for them? And then we're also talking about the trauma of being incarcerated. And so coming out of prison with a trauma or stressor related disorder or symptomology too, how does that present clinically? So I wanna pull you know, uh, Dr. Claver and Nicole into this too about what that speaks to you. Um, Dr. Claver, I see you go first. Yeah, uh, we see this a lot, actually. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, we see hundreds and hundreds of people coming out of jail and prison into our services with quite significant diagnoses, you know, something like schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, um, a label um, that you have is, that's a really powerful kind of branding that you've been given in, a, in an institution. And oftentimes they come into our services and that's, that's not what we see. <laughs> um, and, you know, maybe they've been given medicines that maybe, you know, do impact their behavior in certain institutional settings, um, but, you know, are, are not, you know, really uh, 
related to um, what's clinically going on with them. I'll see. Uh, I'll say by far and away what we what we see when we really kind of unpack people's clinical picture is trauma, 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 and all the sequelae. Um, and and that it's tricky, you know, because as as um, a few people have mentioned, um, sometimes these diagnoses are. Um, doors and entryways into services that are very intensive, that are very helpful. So it's tricky, you know, people might come into these services and, and um, it's not like they don't need intensive <laughs> support, um, but maybe they also don't have that diagnosis that they've been carrying around and labeled with. Um, and it's tied to housing that's been mentioned as well. You know, some of the few coveted supportive housing units in New York City anyway, um, you know, they require these diagnoses and it, it becomes quite interesting um, clinically, ethically, you know, in, in, uh, in these systems, you know, where we wanna help our clients um, get access to improve the social determinants of health, things like housing but we, we don't wanna carry forward these labels. So on the ground, it, it can be, there can be some dilemmas. Yeah, and I think the dilemma breaks down by setting as well. You know, I think I've read statistically emergency rooms, for example, will give a schizoaffective disorder diagnosis at disproportionately higher rates for someone who might be in a 72 hour observation that is acutely presenting as psychotic, but may be the, the source of psychosis may be variant, right? It could be for various different things, but then once they have that diagnosis, it's carried with them on their medical records. So if they're admitted inpatient anywhere, um, especially if they're on Medicaid and, and through a public hospital system, that is what the treating diagnosis then is approached as, even if it's incorrect. And it's not necessarily the fault of the attending uh, psychiatrist because they have time limitations on when they can decide if someone should be admitted or not. Um, I saw Patrick take his mic uh, off and then I'll go to so, Dr. Mancini afterwards. Yeah, no, so Jessica, uh, going back to the data, this seems very complex. We're talking about so many factors here and how are we going to sort of have attribution to whatever it is, the intervention that's going to help improve the outcomes and, and kind of change the trajectory of people who are stuck where they are because of their uh, societal uh, connections. Um, right now, as you know, within the healthcare system, within the payment system at CMS, they're really breaking out the SDOH of the social determinants of health. They're also um, looking at the total cost of care of integrating mental health with the rest of healthcare. And so, of course, now this becomes an issue for cardiovascular disease patients and diabetics and everything. So it becomes a whole different thing. It's not just kind of those people over there with a primary diagnosis of mental health. And so, so all I'm saying is if we can get this data organized, we're in a period of super data analytics, you know, IBM Watson type approach. I am confident that we can take the messages that we're already getting from the rest of healthcare and say, let's apply that to the justice-involved population and disaggregate this data, because we're not measuring it, to your point, Madhuri, um, so that we also pick up the impact of trauma. We, impact, we pick up and can actually track you know, racial trauma and correlate it to these outcomes you're all talking about. And we can actually measure the impact of treating people as statistics as opposed to as the judge and and many of you said as human beings right you, they're, they're so anyway this is no longer some elusive proposition that simply depends on people of good conscience like folks that all of you are trying to work to change your get your arms around this behemoth of a problem we do have an opportunity i believe to shift this whole space uh, uh, and it may be back to the judge's point, but maybe back on finances, maybe the lever that we get this uh, change built on. And, and if that's the case, fine. <laughs> I'd like to get the hearts and minds to change and maybe they will over time, but if we can get this sooner than later based upon 
the economic, the time that these police officers spend picking people up, transporting, the time that the judges spend like pulling their hair out in the court saying, oh my God, is this what I'm spending all my time doing? The time that our justice evolved populations are, all I'm saying is the political opportunity to change this system is upon us if we figure out the right narratives politically to take all that you're saying. And so my last point would be, can you guys, wherever you can, and people who are on the uh, watching, we want at this um, Satcher Center, we want to build the data sets that are going to just aggregate them. We know the data sets are out there, but begin to aggregate them to, to use them to support the policy changes we have. So all of you have in your networks really good access to informative data, even if they're small anecdotal or within your own programs, but please, you know, follow up after this webinar with Madhuri and Daniel Dawes and all the rest and get us this stuff because we wanna build uh, a campaign using data to drive the social change that all of us are on this call trying to accomplish. Right. Dr. Mancini, you had a comment you wanted to make earlier. Yes, thank you. I wanted to, um, I, and, and thank you, Patrick, for the challenge. Sometimes we need to be reminded that, that it is our obligation once we get in this field um, to speak out and, and to, to help find solutions. But I wanted to um, make a comment about uh, what Dr. Claver was talking about diagnosis. And in, in the population that I help, in the population that I serve, um, it's, it's important to know that the, the misdiagnoses that are happening for immigrants and refugees, it's, it's often because of, of human error. Uh, we have individuals performing evaluations that, that do not know um, how to serve people that speak other languages or from other cultures. In many instances, they're using interpreters and, and there's also, that's a whole different conversation because all throughout the country, um, there is different levels of, of certification or absence of certification for interpreters. And many of them are not trained in behavioral health language. So we end up having um, people incarcerated, uh, diagnosed, hospitalized, all kinds of traumatic incidents because of, of misunderstanding. You know, easy example, you know, doctor asks, asks the, um, uh, the client, do you hear voices and, and the interpreter ask the client the question in her language. And she say, yeah, I hear your voice and the doctor's voice. But the interpreter only tells the doctor, yes, she's hearing voices. So, you know, it misses the whole context of, of that. And, and, you know, that causes the doctor to think she's having auditory hallucinations. So, you know, we, we do have some very uh, much work to do when it comes to that. Um, you know, overall incarceration in this country is out of control. More jails are being built, which is, you know, baffles me with all the jails that we already have. But I wanted to touch on one last thing, Patrick, about data, because on, on, unfortunately, criminal justice data rarely disentangles race, ethnicity, and, and some of those other issues. So yes, we can find some good data, but when it comes to helping the people that I'm working with that I, that I serve, we're still in the dark. We, we still don't have the ability because every data collection system that I know at the county, city, state, um, federal, they're all different. So we need, first of all, find a, a homogeneous way to collect this data because otherwise I'm going to tell you something from Georgia and they're going to tell you something from New York and, and it's not going to match. Uh, so I think we need to start with something there. Thanks. Well, you know, we're only beginning to measure uh, by CDC standards, mental health and CDC. Right. Who would have imagined just this year, CDC is starting to track. So we're behind on data and how to measure it. But but let's that take that Madhuri as a takeaway from this webinar is let's get to figuring out some proposals on how we could measure data uh, in a different way. Are there models for what data would capture this sensitivities that have been discussed um, along race, trauma, and so forth. Uh, that would be a good takeaway for, for us uh, after this. Yeah, definitely. Um, Nicole, yeah, go ahead. I'm just going to add to that when we're talking about data and we're talking about the difference between qualitative and quantitative data, that like this data is also coming with 
the the community and their anecdotes and what people are, you know, the peer community, um, the people who are involved in these systems, the mental health workers who are on the street working <laughs> within the communities, um, the parents who are experiencing this disjointed way of working. And I think that we want to, you know, thinking for myself, be careful that we're not losing the voice of the person and knowing that most people we're talking about have been labeled as undeserving in the past and have been discriminated against by government, by institutions. And so we, I, you know, from my perspective, I want to be mindful of that, especially as a white person that I'm taking a perspective of like, is this what I think is best? Or am I engaging the communities that I'm working with in the disenfranchised communities that, um, this, these policies and these programs are really going to affect. And so I just think that that's an important distinction for us to also make here. Yeah. Uh, Cause there is a way to humanize. And there is a way to also say that, like, to not take that the things that we're doing, that we're doing because this is what is best for the community and not what we think as people in power sometimes is best for them. And so, so that's a great point, Nicole. So we got the quickest approval of a drug in FDA history to get our vaccinations out. And they didn't do it by doing it the normal data rich clinical trial way. What did they do? They took a global real world evidence response. So the reason we've gotten expedited approvals is because we've looked at data from Israel. We looked at data from South Africa. We've looked at my point is let's new, use this new concept that our data specific FDA uses. Let's use real world outcomes to your point, right? Of, of people who aren't captured in the quote narrative of the way government does data, right? Let's use this real world evidence approach to data to make the change that we're looking for. Totally agree with you. You know, let's not use clinical data as we used to that only measures principally the majority population and leaves out the voices of people who are um, marginalized. Totally, totally get it. But I think we can do that with this real world evidence kind of approach. So I am looking at time and I just wanted to pose one last question to our panelists. And obviously this is, you know, these are discussions that I can spend 24 hours a day talking about. And the reason why we're doing a five-part series, series is because issues like trauma-informed systems, housing, what a successful reentry program looks like, those are things we are tackling in subsequent ones. And so that may be a reason why in this specific discussion on, on behavioral health that wasn't included. Um, but I want to pose this to any or all of you. You know, COVID-19, to Patrick's point, has really changed the way I think our entire country looks at policy looks at health healthcare systems response, looks at workforce development, looks at what supporting thriving looks like. You know, prisons were so disproportionately affected by the pandemic that you had rates of infection upwards of 80 to 100% of inmates who were seen positive and not getting the access to care that they needed. And then and the workforce itself couldn't sustain itself. So in your mind, you know, let's leave some inspiration with our audience, right? Where do we go from here? What, what can we actually do that's different? 988 will be launched in July. It's the first psychiatric emergency line akin to 911 that the country will implement um, to say if someone's having a psych crisis, we call 988 now. How it's administered is a lot of the discussions I'm having personally with people in leadership of what that actually looks like. Um, but if anyone wants to comment, you know, how has COVID-19 in the last two and a half years changed the way you see your role? and the way we conserve the criminal legal system and those who are justice involved. I'll say a couple of things. Uh, for me, the, the biggest highlight is we need to continue to encourage individuals to come into this field. We have a tremendous shortage of clinicians, so we can have the best plans in place when someone comes out of prison or maybe when they're still in prison, but if we don't have the workforce, if we don't have that in place, we're not going to be successful. So we need to, and we don't have enough people in the pipeline to replace the ones that have burned out and retired. 
Um, and, and we were already short from those that were going to retire in the first place. So we need to we need to do that. And uh, the other one is the positive thing is you know we can't give up. We see progress. We see what what can be done when we put enough people together in a room with a plan of action. We can we can make this happen. Um, we need to be able to give everyone the opportunity to have access to live a, a successful life. Fabulous. Judge Kirk? And so I would say what COVID has given us is an opportunity to gut check our system. There were things that we said we have to be in person for. There are things that we could do remotely. In Fulton County, we pivoted very quickly to be remote. And so now our and, and that included with our misdemeanor mental health court team and our par participants. And that was a blessing because while we were disconnected face-to-face -face with our participants, we have an app that is called Sprocket, which allowed us to continue being connected with them virtually. It's a gamified system. It allowed them to stay in contact, not just with our behavioral health team, but with their pretrial services, with their go-ahead therapy treatment. So it was a reminder of that, that collateral stuff that you all talked about that we ask people to do once you are leaving the criminal justice system or they were still in, but it's a 12 month program. So we have graduated two classes, no, probably three classes of individuals during this period of time that have been connected to us virtually on Sprocket. One of the challenges we are finding now is getting those clinicians back into the jail system because we need you to physically look at people while you are diagnosing them. But I would also say for us, part of that gut check is realizing that Everyone that looks like you isn't on the same page as you. And right. so when we employ people, if those people do not have a, you don't need a lived experience, but you need to figure out what the experience of the person who you are sitting and attempting to coach looks like and where they have been. What I realize, and I would say shop the system. This is a perfect opportunity to shop the system. When I started out as a lawyer, I started in a labor and employment field. And so as a lawyer, we would talk to the executives and the executives would have this vision of what it is they wanted to happen. When it was our turn to go talk to the line employees, they had a plan of how to get through their day. It didn't always match the vision of what the executives told us. And so I think that's important because having been inside these institutions with my clients that I represented, what I realized is the people that are serving them are not the people that the executives believe them to be. They can be mean, they can be disrespectful, and they can be just as racist on, as the people on the outside. So I think now is a perfect opportunity to gut check our system in a true way. So that's my two cents. Your two cents are what we needed to close this out. I you know, wish we had more time to continue um, and I wanna respect everyone's time who came to join us today as well. Um, this does wrap our second round table in our five part series and what an amazing, passionate enriching discussion it was. I wanna thank all of you for your sincere openness, being very candid, um, choosing to actually use your words and create power behind them. And, and obviously as we've seen is create influence of change. Uh, you are champions of equity in your own roles and in this movement. And it's a pleasure to be in your presence and work alongside with you. To our audience, if you had a question that wasn't answered, we do apologize for today. However, we do have a subsequent series coming up because obviously this is not something we can tackle in one round table. And next month we will be looking at exactly what it means to imagine a trauma informed system for the justice involved. Um, taking points from our first two roundtables and seeing what that could actually look through. So I hope you will sign up for that register. Again, it is free. Um, you're welcome to join us with that. This will be recorded. It'll be released and able to be viewed as well. We will summarize this in a written um, format so that people who have needs to be able to share that internally can. So please follow us at kennedysatcher.org, Kennedy Satcher on Twitter, as well as Satcher Health Leadership Institute on LinkedIn for updates on the next uh, roundtable that we have. Um, thank you all so much for joining us and for all of you and your commitment to the work that you do. I wish you health, safety, and wellness as we push onwards in our quest for equity for all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so for your much. public service. Thank you. Thank you.